All right, here we go. Today we have Hollywood royalty in the building. Fred Williamson, a.k.a. The Hammer. Welcome to Vlad TV. It's time to be somewhere. Everybody got to be somewhere. So here I am, right? Here you are. Yeah. Truly an honor, man. Thank you so much for coming in. I'm sure it's going to be fun. Yes. Let's start in the very beginning. So you are born in Gary, Indiana. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you were the oldest kid. Only kid. Only kid. Only kid. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 I had to I had to fight my own way, do my own thing. Me too. Only child. But it's nice being an only, only child. It is. You know, uh, you get all the accolades and and you can control your own uh, uh, life being that way. You know, I mean, I had to fight my way, but I had to fight only because I was such a good looking kid. Everybody thought mm -hmm. I was soft. Mm. So I had to fight every day to show that I wasn't a pushover, you know. Right. You talked about uh, how you built a thug mentality at some point. That was part of the thug mentality, being a young kid who who went to school dressed because my mother always dressed me nice and had shiny shoes. I had to brush my shoes every day. So somehow kids thought that's a sign of weakness. A guy comes all dressed up and he's not dirty. And that was a sign of weakness. So I got shoved and pushed around until I just say, you know, okay, I can do this game. And the last guy, well, I probably was in the <sighs> seventh, eighth grade. He pushed me, and he don't remember pushing me anymore after that. <laughs> so that's what I did, man. And I, be I became kind of an obnoxious guy, too, after having to keep people away from me, challenging me. I don't want to live my whole life as a challenge. Okay, so you were born in Gary, Indiana, but then you moved to Chicago. Moved to, get, moved to Chicago because I had problems living in Gary with all these people who were bothering me, t testing me to see if I was as tough as... They say I was, so I moved to Chicago. Parents will be there, and I wound up going to DuSable High School, and I graduated uh, from DuSable. Okay, so we're talking about the 50s in Chicago? Talking about the 50s, yeah. My, my last year in high school was 56. Okay, so what was Chicago like? Because, I mean, these days, you know, you have the, you know, the gang situation in Chicago is very prominent, the murders and the violence and so forth. But in the 50s, what was it like? Gangs didn't exist, man. It was, uh, you know why? Because... Parents were in control. Mm. You had a curfew, 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock. Uh, the street lights go out, you better be home. So the parents are more involved in the kid's life than they are today. I mean, kids, I hear I hear kids talking back to their parents like, my mother would have knocked, would have knocked me across the room, man, if, to some, the way some of these kids talk back to their parents. So the parents had more control of the kids, and so the kids had to, you know, prove that they uh, were doing the right thing. Okay. So... You graduate high school, and you end up joining the Marines right afterwards? Joined the Marines uh, because I got motivated by the Marine Corps, uh, by some John Wayne movies and some other things. And so I wanted to be a, a Semper Fi guy. But I had a scholarship waiting for me at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. So I was able to uh, go to Northwestern right after. Okay. And you went to Northwestern not on a football scholarship, but on a track and field scholarship. Exactly. I was not a football player. I, did, I started playing football. First of all, I was a track star only because the girls liked the athletes, right? So I had to pick a sport. Football uh, looked a little obnoxious to me, so I didn't want to play football. So I became a track star. I was a 100-yard dash, 200 meters, and 400-yard dash. They called them dash back in the days. And that's where I, I got a scholarship from Northwestern. They said, hey, we... We like uh, what you're doing. And I was a great A student because I had to show that not only was I a tough guy, that I had some brains. I didn't want to be the, the bully in the school. I wanted to be the guy who had some intelligence and can take care of himself. And, I, and the first guy to raise his hand in class when the teacher asked a question, I was the first guy to raise for the answer. So I had a mixture of being a tough guy and being an intellectual guy. Okay, so you go to Northwestern on track scholarship and you actually want to be an architect. I graduated with an architectural engineer. Mm -hmm. I worked at Frank. I went to Frank Lloyd Wright School during uh, during the summers when I wasn't uh, when I wasn't in school. Uh, while I was at Northwestern, a coach named Eric Parsegian came my freshman year. Eric Parsegian came, and he heard about this kid who was about 185 pounds, who was a track star. So he decided to come down and talk to me, and uh, he did. He came down and he says, uh, "Son, I, I like what you're doing in school here. Have you ever played football?" And I says. Why should I play football? Hmm. You know, I got a scholarship here on track, track. Why should I go play football? He said, well, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do this, we'll do that. I said, what? You, we'll give you this, we'll give you that. I said, I'm there, man. I'll play. This is my freshman year. Back in the day, freshmen couldn't play football. Hmm. 
because you weren't, they figured you weren't physically ready and capable of taking the blows and hits. So freshmen couldn't play football. Okay. They offered you a car to play for the football team? Dude, I had the world. and I, I made more money at Northwestern <laughs> than I make here. I have to pay taxes here. I have to pay taxes here. <laughs> okay. So this is what? Boosters giving you under the table money? Boosters. No, a new car. I had a new Thunderbird every year. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it was the boosters. I mean, this was all legal, by the way. I was all legal. I mean, all, <laughs> the boosters could do what they wanted to do. You know, yeah, there was sure. no rules for the boosters. The school, the school just uh, in, you know encouraged it. So. Look the other way. Yeah, they encouraged it. So I, I had a great time. I, held, I, I hated to leave Northwestern. Right, with all the new cars you're getting. Every year, I left with a, with a uh, 1957 Thunderbird red. You know, nice. Okay, so. You graduate college. Yeah. And do you know you're going to the NFL at that point? Or wait, was it the NFL? Because it was the no. NFL and the AFL. The AFL hadn't existed yet. It was 1960. So the AFL started in 1960, but they, were, they weren't that popular. Nobody, went, nobody was going for them. So I had a, a, a chance to play for the 49ers. So I got drafted by the 49ers. Mm -hmm. So I go to the 49ers and uh, we get to the last exhibition game. I'm doing good. But they had me in the wrong position. I was All-American flanker back because of my speed. I was All-American catching the ball. First day in camp, they give me a red shirt in 49ers. I said, what is the red shirt for? It means I'm special? I said, no, son, this is red hickey. So you're playing defense. I said, I'm playing defense. I don't know about defense. Don't you know who I am? At that time, my nickname was Speedy. Hmm. I said, I can catch anything. Anything you throw, I can catch. He says, we don't need defensive backs. We have R.C. Owens. We have a lot of... Uh, all stars here that already uh, passed receivers, so you got to play defense. So I said, okay. After two weeks, every day, they're making me look like I never played the game before. Like I never, I never even put on a uniform. I'm stumbling, I'm falling down backwards. I can't cover nobody. Man. And he comes to me and he says, "Son, you disappointed us. It's red icky. So you disappointed us. We thought you could make this transition." I said, "I told you, I was, I'm not a defensive back. I don't know how to cover anybody." He said, "Well, we'll give you a few more days. To make yourself." You know, show us that you can do improve, or we're gonna cut you and send you home. And I'm saying to myself, man, you're gonna send me where? I'm going back to Gary. I'm going back to the ghetto in Chicago. There's no way. I'm the toughest guy in the neighborhood. You ain't gonna send me back no damn where. <laughs> so that night, I figured out what I was gonna do. So first day of practice, it was my turn to cover somebody. The first guy came up was a all pro receiver, R.C. Owens. I get about one yard off of him, and Red Hick is yelling, yelling at me. God damn it, Williamson, get back. He's going to make you look stupid. And I said, shut up and hike the ball. <laughs> so I said, he said, okay, make him look bad. So they hiked the ball. John Brody was the quarterback. R.C. Owens took one step off the line of scrimmage. I went like that, knocked him out, flat out. <laughs> Red Hickey runs over and says, God damn, Williamson, what are you doing? I said, I covered him. <laughs> He's down, right? He, he said, he didn't catch the ball. <laughs> he was down. He didn't get up. He said, all right, Williamson, back up. Stop hammering my players so I could get some pass offense in. That's how I got the name Hammer, from coach saying, stop hammering my players. So I, I was there to the last exhibition game and then they decided to trade me to Pittsburgh because mm -hmm. they, wanted the, they wanted a receiver that, that was lightning and that had Ray Norton. Ray Norton is just coming off the Olympics and they traded me to make room for Ray Norton. But they forgot to ask Ray Norton if he could catch. Okay. And, and he couldn't. <laughs> So then you go to the Steelers. I go to the Steelers. Uh, in 1960. Yeah. Okay. And you started six of 11 games. Yeah. For that first season. Now, yeah. How did that first season go? I mean. It was good because I, they didn't, I was the cornerback there. I was a safety. So I could, I could hit and I didn't have to concentrate on covering people. So I became a hitter. You know, I, I loved going in the middle because I was, I was a 210 pounds, 220 pounds safety. And I, I loved going in there and, and hitting people. So I had a good, a good rookie year. And I go back to Oakland to bring my gear back because I didn't have a chance to break all my gear when after I got traded from California to, to Pittsburgh. So while I'm gearing my gear, I get a phone call. Al Davis. I said, Williams, why don't you come over here and play in the NFL? We got, we got a new league starting over here. And I says, uh, well, I kind of like where I am, you know? He said, well, you'll be an immediate star over here. Everybody will know your name right away. You'll be an immediate star. So I says, well, I'm great. That sounds good. He said, how much are you making? I understand this now. I'm making 9,005. He said, okay, we'll give you a $500 raise. Come over here for 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I didn't need no car to cross the Bay Bridge, dude. I ran across. <laughs> I was like, I was like lightning crossing the Bay Bridge to get to the Oakland to get ten thousand dollars to play for the Oakland Raiders. That's how I, that's how I got to Ra- to the Raiders. Right, and during that time, I mean, this is not the NFL of two thousand twenty-three, where people are all they do is football. The salary you got wasn't enough to really support yourself. So half the year you were working for Bechtel. I, w- I had my off-season job. My up- after football was uh, working for Bechtel Steel in San Francisco. My dad used to work for Bechtel back in the day. I was like, really? Yeah, exactly. Architect and engineer. I worked for Bechtel. Yeah, and uh, it was a great. It was a great career, and I was having a great time. I had football f- for six months, and Bechtel for the other six months. So I had, I had a good thing going, and then uh, it all changed because I got bored. I got bored with football. Mm. There was no longevity. I didn't see longevity in it, you know? And I got bored with football, and I decided to leave football and just become a full-time architect and engineer for Bechtel. Well, before we get there, I kind of want to go down the timeline for a second. So you signed with the Raiders in 61. Right. And like you said, you became a star right right away. What was it like to be a football star in 1961? I don't really know the difference between a football star and being a star as an individual, because I was a very popular guy. <laughs> anyway, I was tall, dark, and handsome. You know, <laughs> I had no, I had no in, insecurity complex. Okay, I'm not an insecure guy. I'm a confident guy. I can see that. So I've been there all my life. So I don't really know anything I could do except show you the things that I've achieved, things that I've done. Because everything that I've got myself involved in, 100, percent I achieved the maximum in it. Okay, and the only reason I would leave it was because it didn't interest me anymore. It was time to move on to something else. Right, and. At one point, you ended up going to the Kansas City Chiefs. I went to Kansas City because Al Davis uh, called me in one day after a incident I had in a locker room from some kids from LSU uh, who probably had never been in a locker room with black players before from LSU. We got to realize this was way back in in '60, and they were saying negative things. And I, it was like two of them. And I said, "Okay, I'll tell you what. After practice, I'm gonna meet you in the." in the goddamn uh, field, in the middle of the field, and we're going to fight, and I'm going to kick the crap out of both of you guys. So somebody heard me say that, and they went back, and they told Al. And Al said, we can't have the problems here. I said, I'm not the problem. You got two idiots in here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take to the cleanest, man. And he says, well, we're going to have to solve this problem by getting rid of you. We're going to have to trade you. So he traded well, me. Well, you got and traded and because you got into I had, an I argument with two white guys. Two white guys who didn't understand. Two racist white guys. Yeah, who didn't understand that we take showers like them. And they had never seen, I guess, by where they were in LSU and, and the, the, the Southern schools didn't have any black players. So they hadn't been in, the, they heard all black players had tails. All black people had tails, right? So, I mean, it was it was a very strenuous situation in the locker room. And I'm the only guy that stuck up. And I'm saying, listen, you guys got to get your act together. Or I'll take you outside, both of you right now, and beat the crap out of you. And, they, and somebody heard me and went and told Al Davis what I said. Okay, so you get traded to Kansas City because of that. So what were the Chiefs like? Chiefs were very, very happy to have me because I now was a cornerback. I was the biggest cornerback player in the league. I was playing 222, 225. So I became a player that nobody challenged. I mean, I could spend the whole goddamn game the second a lollipop out there because after they started throwing passes at me, they were, they were losing receivers because I was hitting them with a hammer, which was a tackle like this. And if you came after me, forward straight at me, the tackle was like this. So I, I left some pain on the pass receivers. <laughs> so they would call a play in the whole line, because I can hear a pass receiver now. Okay, 33 years late. No, 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 not that one. <laughs> <laughs> not that one, not that one. <laughs> not that one. So, you know, I enjoyed my position when I, because I wasn't really being challenged. Well, you said that when you would, you would walk on the field, 10,000 people would cheer and 10,000 people would boo. Yeah. You were kind of like a polarizing figure. Why is that? But that was great because, first of all, they never seen anybody's style like me. The only person who came close to me and we kind of uh, played the same kind of way was Dick Night Train Lane. But he left his feet. He'd fly in the air and hit people. I was not going to leave my feet. The way I used to tackle guys, I was surprised that they got up. And if they did get up, I'd, you know, I would stand over them and say, you all right? You okay? <laughs> you know? So I became the, bad, became the bad boy, right? Everybody wants to fight me. You ain't supposed to touch these fancy receivers, right, who come out dancing with their little dance that come out and, and do their little dance before they call a play. You ain't supposed to touch them in their mind. But 
you were my target, dude. Mm -hmm. if, if I was so tough on these guys that some of them came out and they would say, hammer is going another way. The player's going over there. I said, well, fine. If you stay right there, I'm not going to hit you. We're not, we're not going to have any, any conflict if you stay there. The play goes over there, then you're safe. But if you come off the line, I can't tell if you're trying to block me or if you're going for a pass. And I'm not let you going to go by me. The only way you stop a guy from beating you is don't let him get by you. So your first job is to get by me. You know, and I was bigger than they were, and I was as fast and faster than most of them, so they couldn't get by me. So I was bumping, doing this. You could do that back in the day all the way down the field. Now you can't do it past five yards. Yeah, You got to be five yards before you can really give him that. But I'm running side to him, bam, bam. I ain't grabbing. I ain't holding, dude. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. And pretty soon, I had more fights. I got a lot of guys kicked out of the game because I had more fights with guys saying, man, you're hitting me. I said, well, that's where you're here, man. You know, <laughs> we're playing football, dog. <laughs> but you said that you wouldn't be able to play with the rules today. No, I couldn't play it today. Like what's so different today than back in the day? You can't touch a player past five yards. And if you can't, you know, you first of all, you talk as a tackler, when you're tackling a guy back in the day, you put your head down and you put your, your head in his chest and you wrap his legs up, pick him up and slam him down. You can't do that today. That's unnecessary roughness. Right. What I do, that's definitely unnecessary. <laughs> so I couldn't play today. You get kicked out every game. I get kicked out. Of, <laughs> hey, I did. I got kicked out of a lot of games. Okay, the 1967 rolls around for the AFL NFL World Championship game, which is retroactively known as Super Bowl One. Yes, this you were in Super Bowl One. Right here. Here's the ring. Here's that's the, the ring. Can yeah. we get a close up of that. The rings they got now, man. They they look like saucers on the plane. I mean, they're like <laughs> mantle pieces. They should be put on a mantle. <laughs> <laughs> this is the OG one. Yeah. Okay. Super Bowl one. Kansas City Chiefs versus the Green Bay Packers. Yep. Green Bay was, you know, favored to win. Of course. Because they were the more established team. You guys were the newer team. Well, they were they were favored because they were the pros. And we were kids trying to be pros. That's how they looked at the American Football League at that time. We were, mm -hmm. we were supposed to be professional. How can we be professional? We haven't been in the game that long. We're playing against these seasoned Green Bay Packers. And I'm saying to myself, I mean, I'm covering guys in the National in the American Football League much faster than these guys over here. Boy, Dolly ain't going to go past me. Uh, a lot of guys, they're slow. So I wasn't worried about anybody beating me. I, my job was going to be easy because I've had to cover guys like Lance Allworth and Charlie Hennigan, guys who run as fast as me, you know, and I didn't have any, they didn't have anybody in over there that, so I, you know, I made my speech. I said, hey, you come by me, man. You ain't getting down the field, dude. I don't, you know, and so they, they thought that was bragging. Right. And they can call it what they want, but I was just telling the truth. Right. You said, uh, I'm going to give two hammers to Dowler, one to Dale. It should be enough. I did one to Dale and he didn't, he tried to run a, he tried to run a sprint on me and I backed up like two yards and dropped him and he went down. They didn't, they didn't throw any more passes. Every pass right. went to the other side. Willie Mitchell got a workout that he had never had before. My defensive other cornerback got a workout. He had never had it before. All the passes were thrown over there. Right. But you actually got knocked out in the game. I knocked myself out because <laughs> I got bored, man. I mean, nothing, <laughs> nothing was coming my way. Okay. <laughs> Nothing. They ran all of the sweeps. They ran them up the middle. They ran on the other side. And all of a sudden, here comes a sweep. My side. Oh, I said, oh, now I'm getting ready to get into some action. So I go in. I go past the blocker. The first blocker was was a uh, like pulling guard, and I went under him. And I lifted him up, and just as I lifted him up to reach for Donnie Anderson, his knee caught me right in the top of the forehead, stunned me. So I'm laying there, man. I'm saying, oh man, I'm laying there, and it's just. <laughs> Come on, Hammer, come on. And they can run over like I was. I thought I was dead because I wasn't moving. They said, no, I'm not getting up. You want me off the field, carry me off the goddamn field because I'm bored. It ain't happening, man. <laughs> you know. And I knew what the people were saying. They got the hammer. They got the hammer because I could hear Green Bay Packers guys. Right? We got the hammer. We got the hammer. You got nothing. <laughs> well, you, end up, uh, you guys end up losing 35 to 10. Yeah, yeah. Well, was that painful? It I mean, was you guys are you got to the very end. It was painful. You've been in the league for like eight years at this point. Yeah, but that's not what was painful. What was painful was some guys were not playing up to their potential. They weren't playing up to what got us there. They had an attitude that, wow, we're playing against the Green Bay Packers. But it didn't make any difference to me. We got the same guys. We had played teams tougher than the Green Bay Packers in the American Football League. Buffalo Bill, the Buffalo team was, was, was tough. Green And San Diego Chargers were tough. This is just another football team. And I was, I was really, 
uh, you know, we're in the locker room, we're getting dressed and they're calling the Chiefs, the Mickey Mouse clubs, right? Hmm. So I brought Mickey Mouse caps for everybody. We're sitting in a, we're sitting there, and I, everybody had a Mickey Mouse cap on because we were going. There. I was trying to get them to go against this, this, uh, this idea that we were weak, weaker than them. But some guys just, just did not play up their potential, and that, that was disappointing to me. That was more disappointing than the loss because some guys just did not live up to their potential. I mean, you look at Super Bowl Fifty Eight is going to happen in a few months. You guys were in Super Bowl One. Did you have any idea how big the game was going to be, you know, this many years later? No, I didn't really have any idea the game would be bigger because I didn't really give a shit. I didn't really care. You know? <laughs> I was a football player. It was a job, but I was an architect. That was okay. really, that was my heart and, and soul. I was a football player because I had talent to do that. I had the speed. I had the size. I had the tenacity. I had the, you know, care, carefree or all ability to play the game. So I didn't really give a shit about whether or not there was a Mickey Mouse club or whatever, I did my job. My job was to keep you from catching passes. And secondly, if you caught a pass, to make you wish you didn't catch the pass. That was my philosophy. That's what I thought. I didn't think beyond that because I knew football was a short term. It was short term. Got it. Got it. Because after, uh, after that Super Bowl loss, you actually retired from football. Well, you, you tried to join the, didn't you join the Canadian League? Yeah, I went, I, I went and played Canadian. I played for Alouettes for a year. Because okay. I went up to Montreal. I wanted to travel a little bit. Mm -hmm. So they invited me to come up and pay me well. I got twice as much money for playing for that one year than I did playing in the States. And I had a great time in Montreal. It was a great city. It was like being in another country. It's like like a foreign country, you know? They're speaking Spanish. They're speaking French. They're speaking everything. And I'm going, wow, this is great, man. A ghetto boy up in Montreal learning French and being uh, being uh, accommodated by the, by the French people. I'm going, wow, I loved it. Okay, so you go back to being an architect. Right. But then you got bored. I got bored again because now I, I'm, I got an hour for lunch. It's nine to five. I'm punching the clock. I couldn't make the transition. After about six months, I said, I can't do this. And one night I was watching television and I saw a show called Julia. Diane Carroll was the star of the show. And I noticed that the guest star role each week was a new boyfriend. And I said to myself in my humble kind of way, I'm better looking than those guys. I'm going to Hollywood and become Dan Kell's boyfriend on the Julia show. So I, at that time I was driving an XKE, I packed up my little XKE, put a trail on my car and drove to Hollywood after getting the name of the producer from watching the show. So I trekked into a hotel, put my trailer in a parking lot, drive to 20, to 20th Century Fox, go up to the gate. I says, uh, I want to come in and see. So the Jewish show people, he said, you have a, you have a driver on, they know you're coming. I said, no. Nah. He said, well, you can't come on. I said, okay, fine. I drove around the block, went to a phone booth, called back to the gate. This is Mr. Hal Cantor's office, We're expecting Mr. Williamson. Will you let him in, please? Hung up. <laughs> went back around to the gate. Oh yeah, we just got a call on you. You're Williamson, right? Yeah, okay. Right down there, bungalow number 24. So I go in, bungalow 24, and the rest is history. Right, so you met with the producer of the show, Hell Cantor. Right. He and came basically out. told him that uh, Dan Carroll's a hoe. <laughs> I said, I he has a new boyfriend every week. No, not the boy. No, not Dan Carroll. The boyfriend was. Well, okay, the boyfriend was the, the hoe. Boyfriend was. The, boyf oh. the boyfriend was. The boyfriend. Well, but she know. had a different boyfriend every week, though. Exactly. Exactly. I said, what? I said you know, you're, <laughs> you're, you're degrading the woman. I said, you, you need a regular star. And he says, yeah, we've been looking for one. I said, well, you don't look anymore. I'm it. I'm, he said, have you ever acted before? Of course I acted before. I did. Two years of Common, uh, Common Jones in Montreal, Canada, and something else in Toronto. I hadn't done nothing. <laughs> he said, You just chose a foreign country because he couldn't check. Couldn't check, right? <laughs> so he said, Well, I like your attitude. I said, Well, okay, try me. It's okay. We'll write a show for you called Dancer in the Dark about a pro football player who retires from football, comes to work for the same company that Dan Kells worked for. They meet, they fall in love, and their relationship happens. I said, It's fine. I'll do it. So we did the show. It's called Dancer in the Dark. And they liked what I did, and they signed me to a three-year contract to be her regular on the, on the Julia show. And they were shooting at, at Universal, no, Twin Cities Fox. So I was in the commissary one day, and I'm walking by a guy who was sitting at a table, and he says, you're the hammer, right? And I says, yeah. He says, I'm doing a football movie. I'm doing a movie that has, not doing a, movie that has a football scene in it. And I want you to be the, be the football player, and put all the football stuff together for us. And it was Robert Altman. 
and the movie was MASH. Right. That was my first movie was MASH. And I played Spiritual Jones in MASH, and I brought a lot of pro guys in. I brought Bug Buchanan and Supernat, a lot of Kansas City guys in. I brought some Oakland Raider guys in to make the football real. So the football stuff was all, all very good hitting and good real stuff. I mean, 2023, does that name bother you? What? The spear chucker? Because that was used a derogatory term towards black people. You can call me anything. I mean, call me any goddamn thing you want to. I don't really care to be anything to me. Your, your, your description of me and your derogatory marks towards me bounces off like nothing because I know who I am. I don't concern myself about what people think about me or what people call me. I mean, they call me the big N-word. And I said, that's your lack of intelligence. That's the worst thing you can say about me? Then I'm okay. I'm safe. If your worst thing you can say about me is the N-word, you're, you're okay with me, man. Well, right, because in 72, you had the movie, The Legend of N-Word, Charlie. Nigga Charlie. Only because I understand the stupidity of America at that particular time. You give them something controversial that they can grab on and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I want to see that. I decided to make a film called The Legend of Nigga Charlie. Now, the, the name was controversial by itself, which created an interest was created an interest. But the way the word the word is not so bad today. Because you see, a lot of black guys get called, yeah, yeah, that's my nigga. That's my my best friend. Yeah, that's my nigga. So that word don't mean as as hard, as harsh as it did back in that day. So I decided to make the movie. And the movie had a realistic plot to it. I was a slave. They beat up my girlfriend. They molested my girlfriend. So I kicked my slave master's butt and ran away to the West and became a gunfighter. So I, I had some vindiction, you know, it was vindictive. I had a, an ability to show that I had some manhood, I could ride a horse, I could do everything a white guy could do. And the movie was a tremendous success. Now, the interesting thing about it, from, from, from 10 o'clock in the morning to noon, it was all white audience mm-hmm. with attache cases, suit and tag, sneaking into the show to see what it was about in New York. I'm standing out there watching it, man. The whole, after, after lunch, after 10 o'clock, after dinner time, all black. Mm. It was never a mixture. In the morning, it was the white with the attache cases and the suit and tie guys would come and see what this movie was about. We did a billboard in New York, 45 foot billboard, shirt off, two guns on the side. And it said, he's coming. Okay? <laughs> we left it there for two weeks. <laughs> Added the words, nigga Charlie has arrived. Whoa, okay. And then we listed all the theaters that he was playing at. Lines around the block, man. I mean, huh. we had police directing traffic. People wanted to see what this movie was about. That was the interest. They want to know what the hell is Nigga Charlie. Right, there's even a sequel the next year. Well, when one does well, you move on. The sequel <laughs> was, was uh, what the hell was the sequel? The Soul, soul of... of... The Soul of Nigga Charlie. Right. And then I did, then I did satire, another satire on it called Boss Nigga that it was called Boss in the theaters, but it was called Boss Nigga. It was me and and my sidekick, DeVille Martin, and it all worked. People was still grasping at this word. I mean, they don't even want to say it now. It's an N-word. But, hey, it's a popular word now. Django, wasn't it loosely based on your movie? Django, the press picked it up in New York and said, Quentin Tarantino must be in love with the hammer because he made a film called The Django and it was about a slave who ran over, kicked the slave master's butt and ran away and became a gunfighter. Right. I mean, I don't, I, Quentin and I get along, so if Quentin <laughs> wants to steal from me and it's copy me, it's all good, man. You know, and we had a good relationship when I did Dust to Dawn, you know, so. Right, yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit later. So, I mean, this was kind of the heyday of the black exploitation era. And that name has always kind of confused me. Because it's it's short for black exploitation, right? The word black exploitation came up because we were making money, more money than the whites were making. My films were across the street with drawing crowds, three to hallway, like Caesar was drawing crowds mm-hmm. over across the street. The other films weren't. So it was the terminology created by Hollywood to demise to make jerk joke out of all the films that had black stars. They created this philosophy. Now, unfortunately, the NAACP 
grasp it and perpetuate it and kept using it all the time. This is Fred Williams' latest black exploitation movie. And I'm seeing, I'm, I'm talking to them. I said, who the hell's being exploited? Everybody is working. There's more blacks on the screen now than ever. You got blacks starring in films now. I'm not, I'm not exploited. I'm happy with, with the money I'm getting. And so I, don't, I never understood what it really meant. You know, who's being exploited? So fine, I could make a movie now. I'm the only black guy in a movie and they'll call it Fred Williamson's latest black exploitation movie. So then I went on and I took an ad out in Variety, back page in the Variety. I said, Fred Williamson is not a black actor. Fred Williamson is an actor. Mm. That created a lot of problems. <laughs> so, but I didn't really care because is 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 Eastwood a white actor? Was John Wayne a white actor? No, John Wayne was an actor. actor. Yeah. You know, why why is it every time I gotta make a movie, I gotta be black actor, I gotta be black exploitation. Make no sense to me. Well, I remember you were saying at that time, the only real black hero in Hollywood was Sidney Portier, but he never slapped anybody. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He wasn't beating people up. That's my philosophy. I mean, okay, so, you know, I mean, Sidney Poitier was a great actor, no doubt, no mm -hmm. question about that. Yeah. But he didn't satisfy all the things that were happening inside black leading men and blacks who want to get into the movie because if somebody calls you that in the word at that time, you want to punch him out. He never hit anybody. He never punched anybody out. So he had his, he had his own niche, okay? His niche was to be the sensitive black actor mm -hmm. who took it on the other cheek. Over here is the hammer. <laughs> I'm gonna take your cheek off. <laughs> if you start you know, degrading me and calling me by those names, I'm taking your cheek off. He ain't hitting, Sidney ain't hitting nobody. So that wasn't satisfying everybody. We need a mixture of both. It's okay to take it, but it's okay to give it too, you know? Right, I guess when you started doing movies, you had rules. You had three rules. They haven't changed. And the rules are? My three rules have not changed. One, you can't kill me in a movie. Mm -hmm. Two, I have to win all my fights in a movie. <laughs> Three, I get the girl if I wanna. Now that was the smart part. <laughs> the girl was the smart part because I know they weren't gonna let me have the girl. Mm. So they had to give up something. So I gave them an out. The out was, Hammer, you can't have the girl. Oh, well, okay, dang. You can't kill me, but I have to win my fights. First of all, how, how can I explain to some kids seeing all my movies and walking down the street, 15, 18 year old kid says, Hammer, I just saw your movie. That guy kicked your butt all over the place, man. Why you let him do that? <laughs> How am I explaining to him? I said, because they paid me a lot of money. Then they're gonna say, hey, you're a sellout, man. Mm. You're a sellout. No, no way, no way. I, I have my rules, I live by my rules and they will never change. Well, in 73, you started Black Caesar. Black Caesar was originally supposed to be for Sammy Davis Jr. Black Caesar was- Script. Yeah, but I mean, I had, I had did a movie I did a movie, a Western movie that I wanted, Adios Amigo, that I finally got Richard Pryor to do. And I wanted Sammy Davis. And I brought Sammy Davis in because he were, he and I were friends. I mean, I knew him very well. I mean, I used to go to his concerts. He used to fly me to his concerts. He introduced me and I'd stand up in the audience. And he says, if I had a big brother, I'd want him to be just like the Hammer. So mm -hmm. we had a great relationship. And we were all talking about doing this movie called Adios Amigo. And I looked around and I, I got 75 people I got to bring in to take care of Sammy. I got an entourage of 75 people, bodyguards, hair people. Well, I says, Sammy, this is a low budget. I mean, I, I don't have that kind of money to, to pay all these kind of people, you know? And he said, well, if I'm gonna do a movie, this is, this is, I'm sorry, man. I mean, this is kind of like what they expect of me. And this is what my agents and my supervisor and my whatever, whatever, uh, you, gotta, you gotta bring these people in. And I said, I can't do it, man. I'm sorry, I just don't have the money to do that. So this was like, a trade-off, you know? Sammy says, okay, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna do this picture either because they can't pay me and they don't wanna afford all the people like you, but I understand that you are gonna do the movie, so go ahead and do the film. But so we had a relationship that we talked about this thing and they couldn't afford to bring Sammy on. Okay, and this became one of your big films. Everything I do is a big film, man. Right, so this became film. one of your bigger films. Every, all my films are big. I don't, do, <laughs> okay. I, don't, I don't do any films that don't make money. I've never made a film that didn't make money. Right. Never. And did this one make more money than the other films? No. No? Nigga Charlie made a bundle of money. Mm. Okay. Okay, and it was called Black Caesar, but in the UK it was called The Godfather of Harlem. Yeah. Which is interesting because now there's a TV show called Godfather of Harlem. Yeah, but see, the differences between America 
and Europe. Mm -hmm. The difference is in America, I'm a black actor. In Europe, I'm an actor. Mm -hmm. So my popularity, believe it or not, my popularity in Europe is four times bigger than it is in the States. Yeah. Because I don't make, to them, black guy beating up white people. That's not how they see it. In America, mm -hmm. it's a black guy beating up white people, right? But they don't understand it. I beat up everybody. I beat up black people, pink <laughs> people, white people, yellow people. I beat up everybody in my films. They get it in Europe. They don't get it here. Okay, and Black Caesar, the soundtrack was done by James Brown. Yep. Now, he only did it for $5? $5.50. $5.50. $5 a yeah. whole musical score by the greatest musician of that time. Yes, because we had a relationship also. I said, okay, I want you to do the music. He said, hey, okay, man, I'll do the music. I said, and I'm going to tell them, music is all yours. All the rights are yours. The mm. studio cannot have any rights to your music. And that's the way I do my films. If I sign up an artist to a film that's popular, I pay for it. It's all yours. Mm. You get all the royalties and the film plays around the world, you know, and, and they get royalties wherever the film is playing. You get all the money. That's how you make a big deal. I became a deal maker. I got into Hollywood, became a deal maker. You do the film, I do the film, you do the music, music's yours. Mm. That's how Sammy worked. Nice. Okay, so around the time that you were doing Black Caesar, you were filming a movie called The Man Bolt. That Man Bolt. That Man Bolt. Yeah. And it was being filmed in Hong Kong. Yep. And you started training in Bruce Lee's studio? Yep. With Bruce Lee? Yes, I did. Okay. Well, what was Bruce Lee like as someone that knew him? How, how, how do you explain that? I mean, I mean <laughs> come on. I, you, that, that's no explanation for Bruce Lee. Bruce mm. Lee was a master in what he did. I did, a film, I did this film called That Man Bolt. This was a universal attempt to do a film with a black actor and not get it called a black exploitation film. Mm -hmm. But that didn't work. As soon as the film came out, it became Fred Williamson's latest action black film, okay? <laughs> so, but it was Universal's attempt and they, wanted, and they went as far away from anything that was racial as you possibly could. That's why we shot in Hong Kong. That's where we got into the martial arts. Uh, I studied with, with Bruce Lee's school. They teach, which the first thing you learn, we're sitting down with our legs crossed for like three months because I stayed there after the film was finished. Before you get up and talk about a pink belt, the yellow belt, purple belt, that didn't mean nothing. You learn the philosophy and the mentality mm. of what martial arts is about. You don't learn to fight. You learn not to fight. That's what you learn. That's the big difference in America. Here, you pay $125, you got the pink belt. $250 more after two, two months, you got a yellow belt. $500 later, you got a, mm, right. you got a chatus belt. You know? mm. By the time you get to the $1,000 mark, you got a black belt. So right. you paid for it. You paid for it. Right. And it's different, you know? Mm -hmm. So... I was into the philosophy of martial arts. I didn't want to be a martial artist. I'm in the Hall of Fame of martial arts in, in some cities around the country, but martial art was never, was never my motivation. It was the soul and things that I was learning as a human being that really invited me for the martial arts. Well, Michael Jai White, who we yeah. both know very well, yeah. he's a regular on my show, and he said some stuff that people have been upset about ever since. He said that on a one-on-one -on -one fight, he would beat Bruce Lee. And he's saying that because he's physically a lot bigger than Bruce Lee. Yeah. He's also a serious martial artist. And people are like, oh, how dare you say that about Bruce Lee? If I had said that amongst fighters, they'd completely understand. There's not one real, not one real fighter that would dispute what I said. Right. Because they know. 20 pounder versus a 130 pounder. Yeah. Uh, at the time I said I was 235, but <laughs> if, it's like. 100 plus pounds. Exactly. And then somebody who is not a fighter. So even if, if it's amongst elite fighters, Floyd Mayweather is, and I'll, I'll defend this with anybody, is the most advanced fighter who ever lived. Mm. The, is, it should be no disputing that. No disputing that. But there's no freaking way in the world he's going to beat Mike Tyson. He could run across the street, <laughs> dive off a table, and punch Mike Tyson with all he has, and it's not going to not going to affect them. Yeah, it's just it's it's just physics. If that was a one on one fight between him and Bruce Lee, I would stop it. <laughs> okay, because I don't want to know who wins. <laughs> Both of you winners. <laughs> I would stop it. You stop you, it. Yes. So your your job would be to kick my ass and get me out of the way because I would stop the fight because it ain't important which one is the best. Uh, 
You both are good. You both are intelligent. You're both bright. Don't do this. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. In the 73, you actually posed uh, nude and Playgirl. I posed nude and Playgirl because they were showing all these uh, white guys with their stuff hanging out. Right. And I'm going to do Playgirl, but you never saw my stuff. Oh, you were like fully. Oh, nude. no. My stuff was. Okay. No, my I, stuff. I didn't look it up, just no, so you know. Dude, I did the cross leg. <laughs> I, did, I did the cross leg thing like this, buck naked. I'm hiding my stuff. Okay. You can't. You, you can't buy a magazine for free and see my stuff just for the cost of the magazine. Okay. No way. No way. That was, I did it a whole lot more stylish than anybody did in the magazine. Fair enough. Okay. So uh, there's a story I heard. Bill Withers. Yeah. He was married uh, for a year to Denise Nichols. Wasn't married at that time. The okay. time we, Denise Nichols was my star of Nigga Charlie. Okay. And, we had, uh, and I respected her a lot because she was, mm -hmm. she was a very sensitive lady. She was a great actress. And we had a problem that occurred. She was dating Bill Withers. Mm -hmm. And Bill Withers did not like the idea that she was on location, location with the hammer. Right? <laughs> and he thought that there was something going on between me and her. And there wasn't. There wasn't. Because okay. I, I learned you don't, you don't have a an intimate relationship with your leading lady, because then you lose control. And you have to have control on the set. If you don't have control, then you, you're a lost person. So one time uh, he came and he, he came upon this, the hotel where we were staying and he started knocking on the door for her to or come out and talk and she wouldn't come and he kept pounding on the door. And I, I happened to be in the vicinity and he finally went into the door, broke the door in just as I got there and he was starting to do something that he shouldn't have been doing to, to her. And I had to, I had to uh, intervene. <laughs> you beat up Bill Withers. I intervened. <laughs> you intervened. I intervened <laughs> and he promised not to come back. Okay. Because there's a song called Who Is He and What Is He To You? Yes. And the lyrics go, a man we passed just try to stare me down. And when I looked at you, you looked at the ground. I don't know who he is, but I think that you do. God damn it, who is he and what is he to you? <laughs> and that I heard is about you. <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> you are not denying it, so it is what it is. I, I, don't, I don't take full credit for that. <laughs> no. But the incident that happened reflects the words to that song. Because okay. I had to keep him. First of all, I didn't want to hurt her because she's, in, she's making my goddamn movie, you know? Mm. If you hurt her and put some bruises on her now, I got to wait for the bruises to go away, and 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 maybe she was a little upset. But the fact that I came in and got involved before it really got serious, got overly serious. It already started a little bit, and uh, I had to uh, do what I had to do, and he went away. Mm. Okay, and then in '74, Three the Hard Way, starring you, Jim Brown, and Jim Kelly. Yeah, and uh, you know, I was talking to Michael about this. Uh, you know, before the interview, he was saying that the, the great part of that era of you guys doing those films together was that, you know, like with you and Jim Brown were two alpha males working together. Yeah. You just didn't see that in movies. You know, like the white audience had like Robert Redford and Paul Newman. Yeah. But in the, the black community, like the big black alpha males would never work together. Yeah. But you and Jim Brown became very close and kept doing movies together. Well... It was a great relationship that we had, the three of us, Jim Brown, Jim Kelly, because we each represented something different. Hmm. Jim Kelly represented the martial arts side. Jim represented the masculine side. Me, I'm like the little butterfly, you know? <laughs> I can do this, I can do that. And if you need my help, I can come in and do some damage hmm. too. I played that role, so I didn't play it against Jim or against Kelly. Everybody did their own thing. So we were, not, we were not competing with each other. That's what made the film work. We were not competing. Jim had his pal, Kelly had his, and we embraced the friendship. So everybody did their own thing, you know? So that's what made it work. How good was a martial artist was Jim Kelly? I mean, have you ever seen him actually get into a real fight off camera or anything else like that? No, I've never seen him get into a fight, but his attitude made him a sensational martial artist because he didn't, you know, uh, he's the kind of guy that if he got into a situation in a bar and a guy was bothering him 
he would be like me and he'd be like Jim Brown. He'd say, you don't want to do that. Mm. You know, calm down, man. You want, let me get you a drink, you know? He doesn't back up and go, ah, you know, you don't do that. He'd say, mm. I'm, hey, you don't, you don't say I'm sorry either. You say, you don't want to do that. Mm. Whatever you, in your mind, get rid of it, have a drink, or let's just walk away here. All three of us had this kind of mentality, all this kind of source. I don't, I don't have to prove that I'm tough and Jim, Jim didn't have to prove it because his image, you know, dictated that he was Jim Brown. Yeah. Kelly had seen him kill, kick 18 people's butt at one time in the right. film. <laughs> the hammer, the guy called the hammer, he must have some kind of <laughs> ability. So we didn't go around proving it. We did not stress that. We let the image take care of itself. I had a problem with Jim one time. We did a Western. Oh, okay. Called Take a Hard Ride. Yeah, that was the next movie you guys yeah, did. Yeah, take a hard ride. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got to cross this ravine and this bridge that was made by rope and boards and stuff. And it was maybe about uh, 75 yards long. And we couldn't ride our horses across. We had to walk the horses across. So mm -hmm. I'm in the front. I'm walking my horse. Jim's behind me walking his horse. So we get all the way across. And as we get across, Jim comes running to me, shoves me. He said, Goddamn man, get that goddamn horse's ass out of my face. I said, Jim, <laughs> walk slower. <laughs> you, know, you know, he says, I'm telling you, if we do it again, that goddamn old horse's ass better not be in my face. It's okay, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, that was the moment that, uh, that was the, I didn't forget. What I had heard in that movie, in Take a Hard Ride, I guess the director felt that Jim Kelly couldn't act. So the only way they would take him on is if he was a, like a deaf mute. <laughs> no, it's, it's, we was trying to find a way that we all could do a, a Western together, something that, was not typical. And we, since Jim was a martial artist, we decided we had a conversation. We said, Jim, you could be an Indian, you know, an Indian. And, and Jim said, well, I don't know about Bali. It. It's, it's okay, well, look, I tell, you, I tell you what, you don't have to have an Indian accent. We'll have you do a scene where we say that your tongue was cut out by some bad guys. Hmm. And we never thought he'd take it. <laughs> <laughs> but he did. He did. <laughs> Because so he couldn't talk in the movie. He couldn't talk in the movie because right. he, had, he had no tongue. But what well, worked? <laughs> we're riding. We you see me and Jim galloping along, and then you cut to the top of the hill, and there's there's Kelly, you know, viewing everything. Wherever we were, Jim Kelly popped up. So he was like a roving Indian kind of a guy. <laughs> so it worked well within his martial arts stuff. Well, then that next year, '78, you were in the original Inglorious Bastards, which Quentin Tarantino redid yeah. in 2009. Who had the better movie, you think? What happened? Who had the better movie? Who had the better Glorious Bastards? We did. Me and <laughs> it was the one I shot in Rome, Italy. Mm. It didn't, it was, I mean, Quentin was mixed between sensitivity and comedy. Yeah. Because he had a stupid, who was the lead, lead of that movie? Playing a stupid. Uh, uh, Brad Pitt? Yeah, playing stupid stuff. No, no. If you're going to make a war movie, you make a war movie that's serious. My Inglourious Bastards were like five years ahead of him, maybe even more, that we did in Rome, Italy. Mm. The Titans made the movie. Then, and it comes his movie. And they got, he got a little flack for that. I think it cost him a few bucks to change the title. See, he spelled it different. Yeah. He spelled it with an E. With an E, yeah. So that was his claim that he wasn't stealing the movie, but it didn't work. <laughs> okay. It didn't work. Well, I had heard that you did an insane stunt on this movie. Yeah. I did several of them, but they wanted me to jump off a moving, jump off a, a bridge into a moving train. And I said, yeah, why not? Wait, do it. They wanted you to jump off a bridge onto a moving train. Yes. And you agreed to this. In a minute. In a minute. In a minute. Okay. I'm the hammer. What? <laughs> How fast is the train going so I can I judge? I would quit at that point. So I, I said, I'm judge. not doing this movie. You know, I, no, dude, I said, <laughs> not only did I had to do that, I had to, Gabe, the train was coming, and I was maybe 50, 75 yards away. So I had to run up a hill. I ran up a hill, <laughs> run to the bridge, swing myself around, and prepare to jump. And as the train went up, doom, I jumped. Not only that, I had to climb inside of the plane while it, a train while it was moving before we got to another bridge, because if I didn't make it inside, I would get wiped out by the other bridge. But, but <laughs> So I made it inside and then fell down. And as I get up, both Simpson is in there. And he was shooting at some people, and the guy comes out, and bang, shoots me. And I done done all this miracle shit, and I get shot. Okay, now my rule again, you know, I don't die in a movie. So 
blew the cigar out, put it in my mouth, opened the train door and it kept moving. And he says, see you later. Pushed me off the train and I jumped and I rolled over, rolled over and took the cigar and looked up, you know, let people know I was still alive. <laughs> <laughs> put the cigar in my mouth and Boatswain's Bo Swinson train kept going and it blew up about a hundred yards past me. <laughs> and I'm still laying on the ground with my cigar. Still alive. <laughs> Okay, and uh, in 82, you end up doing one down, two to go with Jim Brown again, Jim Kelly again, and Richard Roundtree this time. Yeah. And he was a big star at this point. Shaft had already come out, right? Yeah, yeah, Shaft was out, Shaft. But again, it was, you know, I had the power to do it. I had the power to pull them together. And this is what I wanted to do, you know, to show that we could work together. They were, there's a team. There is no guy that thinks he's better than the other guy. Mm -hmm. We had this camaraderie. And I wanted to sell the camaraderie that we had. Jim Brown, Jim Kelly, Richard Roundtree, I mean, and me. What bigger cast can you ask for at that time? The black heroes, the black stars, you're gonna kick some butt. And that's what we did. And we kicked white butt, pink butt, yellow butt. <laughs> we kicked black butt, we kicked butt. And that's really what I was trying to do is, is was really kind of a, intensify these guys' career because they weren't really working that much at that time. And I, I was lucky enough to be able to put pr some productions together and raise money. So it was my my uh, pleasure to work with these guys. Well, yeah, you guys reunited 15 years later in Original Gangsters. OG, again, man, you bring, you bring friends together and you let them do their best thing. Whatever you know it for, I'm gonna I'm highlight it. Kelly, whatever you know. Whatever you know it for, I'm highlighting what each one of these guys do. And it worked like a charm. There was no ego problems. It worked like a charm. At what point did you go from just being a paid actor to saying, I'm going to start writing these films. I'm going to start producing these films. I'm going to start directing these films. I'm going to start handling the distribution and everything else like that. Because how many films have you done yourself? About 45 or 50. 50 films yourself idea of, of, of any business, you can't be a success in any business if you don't understand the business of the business. Mm. Also have to understand that the longevity of whatever you do has a limited. So you have to be changing and growing all the time because whatever you did two years ago may not work now. So if you don't have the ability to make those decisions yourself, they're going to forget about you. Because they only remember the, the people last week. They only did, whoever did something last week, that's who they remember. If you're not doing something now, they don't remember you. You have to remind them, you know? So I try to put myself in a position that they will never have to say, whatever happened to the hammer? Whatever happened to Fred Williamson? What is he doing now? That so far in my life has not happened. Because you hear about something that I'm doing all the time. What was the biggest budget film you ever put together yourself? Two and a half million was, uh, and I got and I got screwed royally, man. Uh, mm -hmm. Orion did our film Original Gangsters. Mm -hmm. Now, my again understanding the business of the business is what I'm is what I'm good at. I raised the money through foreign sales. Foreign sales to me means that Germany, Italy, Sweden, France. One-on-one. -on -one. I sell it to you for France. You give me a check. It's all yours. Here's the film. Give me a check. It's over. You don't owe me any more money. I kind of know what my film is going to do in France. Give me the check. You can burn it up if you want to. I don't really hear shit. Next. Germany. Okay, here's my... You give me... You, here's the film. I take the check. Country by country by country. Sell deal. Not a distribution deal because then you're going to lie to me like... <laughs> right. Like... Nobody came to your movie. I said, well, I walked around and I saw lines around the block. You tell me nobody came to my movie? What are you talking about? Well, we got distribution costs. We, got, we had to bring some people oh, in. Yeah. No, I don't yeah, play that I'm game. I'm still waiting for my first royalty check for my first See, I don't play that. I don't play 15 that. years later. So that's I not my game. It. I don't play that game. That's, yeah, why my market, that's, why my, that's why my foreign market is so big. It's country by country by country. And I'm there, each one of these countries. I'm in front of them. Here's my new movie. Play it. Show it. Here's what I want. I want from you... I want 125,000. For you, 150,000. Mexico, 30,000, okay? I know, I, I don't want no pesos, pesos, $30,000. And I kind of know what each country does well with my films. That's how I've been able to survive. And that's how I raised the money 
for some of these films. And I raised that money for the original gangsters and the movie was going to be the biggest so far and Orion filed bankruptcy. Mm. Three weeks into distribution. Wow. It had made almost $40 million. I made it for a million five. Made it $40 million and they filed bankruptcy and everybody got a dime but me. Stole your money. All of it. All of it. Well, there's something interesting you said when you talked about getting into the business and knowing the business. You said, he who counts the money first makes the most money. That's right. Because Ryan was charging me for guys flying around to the theaters to seeing how the theaters were doing and charging me the plane fare, the hotel fare, whatever whatever they did, I went, however food they ate, whatever party they went to, I got charged back to the film. So that, that was something that was kind of new to me because that was my first film that I gave to a big distribution company like Orion, who was big at the time, but they lost their money on Eight heads in a duffel bag, I think, with, with the Pesci. Oh, later on. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So they lost their money. They Not, not went, a great movie. They I went bankrupt it. on that movie. Mm. And, to re- and to pay their bet, to pay their debts. Oh, they went bankrupt in order to... Oh, they took the money from your movie took to the pay back movie, pay that them, went bankrupt. Oh. And bankrupt. Yeah. Wow. Okay. At what point did you start doing these King Cobra ads right here? <laughs> Don't let the smooth taste fool you. King Cobra, I did a film called Black Cobra Ah. in Rome, Italy. And I'm saying, okay, I'll do the Cobra bill ads if you let me do it my way, with my style. I ain't dancing, I ain't singing, (laughs) I'm not pushing it, I'm not selling a brew, just have a style, you know? And then I hit the the desk, boom, and the can jumps up in there and I grab it, it's hammer time. You let me be the hammer, I'm interested. As long as you don't, I will take a job, any job that does not destroy my image mm. or my character. Have you had that? Have you turned down roles where- Every day, I turned down you roles- You wear a dress or, or do something- No, I turned down You know, that's just not you. I turned down roles weekly. Weekly. Weekly about doing this, you know? With, and it's not about the money because the money is good. You want to pay me big bucks to do this? And first thing I say, do I die? Well, uh, I don't know if we can work around that, uh, Mr. Williamson, but, uh, and I'm going to think, listen, I mean, of all the movies you got for me to play in, you want to kill me? Is this a conspiracy? <laughs> you want to get rid of the hammer? I ain't going down, man. I may just disappear okay. somewhere, but it'll be of my own accord. You've never died in any movies. I died in, uh, from dust to dawn, but I didn't die as the hammer. Okay. I don't know if you remember, guy bites me. I turned to this big, ugly thing. Oh, oh yeah. yeah right. Right. <laughs> okay. So I didn't go down as the hammer. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's talk about that. Death Still Dawn, which stars George Clooney and Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. Directed by Robert Rodriguez. Right. And had that Selma Hayek scene in it with a snake. Selma Hayek was. Woo! Sir, I was that was Selma at her, at her height, I think, at her absolute prime. They had to hypnotize her a little bit to bring her out and dance with this big snake around her. She was scared to death. Huh. She didn't want to do it, but they gave her a little, little help and she came out with this snake. But hey, I don't know how much help they gave her, but they wouldn't have been enough for me to come around with a snake. That goddamn big wrapping <laughs> itself around me while she's dancing and this snake is moving and curling around her. Dude, I mean, that took a lot of hoops yeah. To do that. Were you there during that scene? Oh, yeah. She, she, uh, oh, danced, she danced on my table. <laughs> oh, you remember? Okay. She, I, was, I had a domino. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She exactly. danced on my table, messed up my domino set, right? Mm. So. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. We got to redo this scene. My dominoes are all messed up. It's, the co- continuity is going to be all off here. Yeah. Let's, let's redo so, it. Uh, it was great, man. She, she had a lot of courage and a lot of strength to do that movie. How's Quentin Tarantino as an actor? Because you don't usually see him on that side of the screen. No, but he, he didn't have the ego to be an actor. That's not his ego. His ego is satisfied by pulling off deals and doing something different and spending a lot of money and doing something unusual. That, that satisfies his ego. Being in the film didn't, satisf- didn't, didn't do that for him. He just wanted to be in it because to, to just show that it's his, it's my movie, I put it together because 
if you if you're the producer and you raise the money, you don't agree to die in a movie. You know, we chopped him up. He got <laughs> chopped up in <laughs> in the movie. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. He went down. So he just wanted to be in and be out. I mean, that's that's not what satisfies ego. I mean, when you look at, for example, Pulp Fiction, and you know, Pulp Fiction borrows heavily from the black exploitation era. Yeah. There's the whole controversy over Quentin using the N-word. Yeah. Remember how it's not yeah. N-word storage, you yeah. bring a dead body over here and so forth. I remember Samuel Jackson was like, Quentin's not not racist. He's just such a fan of the black exploitation era. And this is something that they would say in the dialogue of these types of movies. So what's your take on that? It was just capitalizing on what was popular at the time. Black exploitation was something that was, everybody used this dialogue, everybody used this word. Mm -hmm. So he was cap capitalizing on the popularity of black exploitation. That's all. He didn't make, the movie wasn't that great. It was okay. Had a lot of interesting people in it, but it wasn't such a great movie. But black exploitation sold the movie. Mm. I feel you. Because at one point you did an interview where you said, Oprah doesn't represent blackness. She doesn't. That was a, how can anybody be a millionaire and, and act the way that she does and not share it with people in Chicago? She didn't done anything for the people in Chicago. She didn't help the people in Chicago. She didn't done anything then when she was coming up doing her thing. So to me, that's not blackness, man. Blackness is sharing the responsibility. If you have the power to make changes, to do something different, why wasn't more people working on her show that were black? She had one girlfriend that she kept on the show the whole time, but I mean, she could expand at the city. She could have been the mayor, the, the governor of whatever in Chicago, because she was the, the lady, she was powerful. Come on. Well, you said something about when she does films, she shows her natural self, but when she does TV and so forth, she's always done up and... But you notice when any film she's ever done, she's never done it as Oprah, she's done it as, as Mama Oprah. Mm. Plays like the role Mammy, I, you know, real, real, dialect southern unintelligent woman but she's bright and she's smart and, she, and in her movie she plays this you know mama mammy mammy kind of a role i mean to me that go the other way be mammy over here and then in real life do something else but i mean no give me just one sec <laughs> so what you got out there? Oh, there he is. So, someone wanted to stop by during the interview. Hey there. What's up, dog? <laughs> How's it going? What's up, dog? Hey, come on. You know what's crazy? What? I swear to you, I have a, a shirt at home. Yeah. That the, the guy, there's a guy on the front of the shirt that looks a lot like you. Could be me. It's crazy. Could I mean, the, the resemblance is crazy. <laughs> but we're all looking like any goddamn way. So what the fuck, man? Hey, well, they say that. They say that. <laughs> Get a chair. Sit down, man. Oh, man. Wait a chair. Wait a chair. Hold up. Get him a chair. Can we, can we feel both of these, these chairs yeah. are higher. And no. There's no way I'm sitting higher than this man. No, I raised the, I raised the, I raised the camera up. <laughs> That's what I did. Bring the camera to eye level. How you doing? I ain't telling you shit. <laughs> <laughs> you be mimicking me. I ain't telling you well, shit. Well, you, you know that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I got uh, uh, copped your hat. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I talk, we've been talking about you a little bit. Yeah. You know, I said, you know, what you're doing is great, man. And you're going to let your wife out shine you pretty soon. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I was going to, next time I see you, I was going to tell you this. I got some, I got some advice for you. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first got into the business, after about two films, I had my manager says, you're talking black, like a black man. Mm. And I didn't understand what he meant. And then he showed me, you and I have this, and all black people have this ability to go high when we talk. Hey, mm. man, what's up, man? <laughs> you know? yeah. And he said, don't do that. Mm. Don't do that. Because it defies your presence. It defies right. what you're trying to represent. Right. Right. So you have to be a little careful mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. You can go, hey, man. Now, hey man, what's up? Wow, man. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. do that, right? Mm -hmm. Don't do that. I, hey, I, I hear you. You know, you, you remind me of like I remember when I'd be visiting my my relatives in South Carolina, uh -huh. and I noticed that my uncles they would speak differently when yeah. they would still talk to certain yeah. folks. Yeah. And I'm like, well, why do they look? What they they look down? Yeah. And the voice changed. Yeah. And I and I was really aware of that. And I could tell when folks were uh, talking about 
white folks, yeah. just by, even if I didn't see who they're talking about, they would say Mr. So-and-so. But you what, know? What, you, what you will find, this will change your performance mm. because you are physically representing this voice that's inside of you. And you give it away when you go, hey, man, how you doing? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you can say, hey, man, how you doing? Without, hey, man. You yeah. know, don't mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. It got takes it. away from what you represent. I believe, yeah, I, I got you. You know, have you I, heard, have anybody told you that before? You know, um, no, nobody's ever said it the way you just said it. Yeah. Well, that's what my manager's a white guy it says to me. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, you got this physique and everything and blah, 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 but you you talk black. I said, what do you mean talk black? Mm. Well, yeah, I didn't talk black. I just say, what were you talking about? Mm -hmm. I said, see, you're talking black. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it might be a, a coping mechanism to make other people feel comfortable. No. You know? This is, it's your world. Right. Exactly. You know, fuck exactly. This is, exactly. This is, this is your world. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I hear you. I'm, I'm with that 100. Yeah. So I know you guys are talking about some good stuff. Oh, man. This, this guy raped me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you got all this shit from, man. Oh, yeah, somebody might have told him some stuff. I don't know. Right? <laughs> I don't know who that could have been. The Bill been. Withers story, I'm snitching. Came yeah. from him. Yeah, Came man. from him. Man, y'all don't know. Y'all don't know. Do, do you understand what imagery, how important imagery is? Let me tell you, I was a kid, and I watched Hell Up in Harlem. Mm. I, it, it was on a, um, a drive-in, right? I couldn't understand one word. I stood there and would watch over and over this man just because that image. I'm like, that's a badass dude. <laughs> I would, I'm like, I want to be like that. And I had a friend, friend Freddie. He lived in the area near the um, near the uh, driving, and I would go to his house and watch it again because from where he, where his back porch is. You can watch the whole movie. You <laughs> can't hear a damn thing. <laughs> you can't hear a damn thing. All, all but that's the first thing. And and I would watch his movies. He was bigger. He's he bigger than he is now. <laughs> but like, it was like that. And it was like, it drew me. Yeah. Had no idea I'd be following in his footsteps. But that's kind of what we've been talking about. Like, yeah. Image is everything. You know, that's why I got three rules, I tell you. You can't kill me in a movie. After one of my fights, and I get the girl at the end of the movie. Now that's their fucking out. They go, okay, we can't give you all three, but what you give you, we'll, we'll, you can't have the girl. I said, I in my mind, I don't want the bitch no mother. <laughs> you don't understand. I'm just giving you, I'm giving you an out. I don't want the bitch no way. <laughs> you know, because how can I explain to an 18 year old, or 20 year old walking down the street and say, hey, the hammer, yeah, yeah. Why you let that guy beat you up, man? Why you let that guy kill you? I can explain it to them. If I say, well, I got paid a lot. Oh, you're a sellout, huh? Longevity, man, is, is something that you have to nurture. Yeah. Be careful about it, because it can go away quick. No, we just, uh, before we got here, we were talking about him, you know? Yeah. Mm. And, well, I mean, this is who actually hooked us up together. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, hey, uh, I, I got Fred Williamson coming. You should come by. He's like, yeah. oh, hell yeah. <laughs> you. you uh, <laughs> What, what was the timing from the, when I said I'm on my way to when I got here? About an four hour minutes. or so, yeah. Oh, you got no, four no, minutes. Four oh, yeah, minutes. Yeah, right down the street. You were prompting him because he was really flaky, man. I wasn't flaky. Folk, took three or four I calls. Flaky. Could three or four you calls. You were completely get unreachable the entire day. I texted you 38 times and I had multiple people call you. Yeah, but straight to voicemail. If I say I'm coming, he's texting me saying, are you coming? So I'm going, mm -hmm. I, I'll be there. I'm texting back. I'll be there. He's texting back. I, 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 I didn't get it. I'll be there. I got, I got no responses the entire day. No. No, what's the date? No. Today. Why? Because <laughs> a week ago, I said, I'm coming. Okay. Fair enough. Fair you enough. Know? Well, I'm here. I, I knew my staff was here when you got here. <laughs> but you yeah. weren't. I was not. I was 20 minutes late. Because I didn't know you were That's coming. how they are. Yeah, they think we like it. They think we like it, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how big of an influence? You know, I mean, I know you watched him on the drive-in and didn't really get to see, but once you actually started seeing his movies, what did you think? Oh, my goodness. There, there was nobody cooler mm. than this man. And, you know, and, like, as far as, like, I, I still don't look as handsome as the dude. That's true. I mean, that's, you know, so yeah. there you go. I understand how you feel. But so, you know, <laughs> so, but, you know, that, I mean, as far as, you know, the, the like, a, an epitome, I would be, I'd be like, okay, 
uh, I'm sorry, your James Bond don't, he can't mess with this dude. Mm. Like him and Jim, yeah. th those, those are my heroes. And just blindly, I'm like, those are the images I want to be like, mm. you know? Jim, Jim was, you know, he, he had the, you know, the intimidating the, the men and this dude ha not only had the men but he had the women <laughs> you know, so so these was like these was what yeah. i frankenstein myself to be we were discussing earlier about how we uh, you know we, we got along but you give each guy his space mm. let him do his own thing and you find a way around if you're smart enough you found your way around it to introduce yourself in it you don't compete with people that you respect mm. you find how you you can fit in Jim Kelly, Jim Brown, me doing Three the Hard Way was three ego maniacs. <laughs> but we there understood that. We understood that. Jim do this, Kelly do that. You know, I'm gonna be like a butterfly. I'm gonna fly around and fit my way in. You know, <laughs> I ain't gonna compete with him. Like I was telling him earlier, we did this Western called Take a Hard Ride. Mm -hmm. And we walk across this bridge and I'm leading the horse. And Jim is behind me walking with his horse. You get across this bridge, Jim jumps me, pushes me, man. Get that fucking horse's ass out of my face. I said, Jim, walk slower. Because he's walking behind me. Pulling yeah. his he's pissed off. He thinks that I'm walking the horse slow because <laughs> the tail was hitting him all in the face like this. <laughs> said, Jim, Jim, I'm sorry, man. You know, walk slow, dog. <laughs> but that's the kind of camaraderie we had, you know. And we, we didn't compete. I wouldn't compete with him if I did a film with him. I wouldn't compete. I'm gonna stand back and see how I can fit in. Mm. I'm not gonna compete with him. You know, he can kick his foot higher than man, but I got bigger feet, so maybe I can kick mine lower and hurt the motherfucker more than he hit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I find a way to fit in. You don't compete, man, and that's what we have to do as people, especially since we are the minority. Wherever we go, wherever we are, we can't compete with each other. Mm. We love compete it. with what's out there, but we can't compete with each other. I love it. Michael, I actually brought up the whole Bruce Lee thing. Uh, you know, I was saying how you would beat Bruce Lee in a fight, and I actually, you know, asked Fred what he would do if he saw that and got a very interesting answer. Stop him. Mm. Quit that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Stop him. Both of you winners. Fuck who win. You got your people who say you win. You got your people who say you win. That's who you both winners. You both walk away winners. Fuck mm. that fight shit. Mm. And you know, Fred actually trained with Bruce Lee at his school. In Hong Kong. In Hong Kong. When he did uh, That Man Bolt. Yeah. Man. So we talked about that whole thing. And when I asked him to really describe what was different about Bruce, he said he couldn't even do it. How do you do that? How do you describe him? You know? yeah, how do you describe a guy who created something that everybody wanted to be like and everybody wanted to emulate? I mean, how do you describe that? You know? True. Why is, why is black people faster than white people? Why is that? How do you describe that? 90% of, of black people are speed-wise quicker and faster than white people. If you don't believe it, line up four brothers over here and put up four guys over there. You'll see, I ain't talking about fighting now. I'm talking about if I drop this ball, see who gets it first. I'm gonna get it first. It's just the way it is. Mm. You don't explain it. Just is what it you is. You experience it. Uh, Michael, what's your favorite Fred Williamson movie? Oh, that would have to be, man. You know, that's a good that's a good question because that man Bolt, I love. Uh, no, no, it, it has you know it has to be uh, Black Caesar. Black Caesar it has to be Bl Black Caesar because that that's the one that started it. That and Hell Up in Harlem, because you know he just he was just a cat. You know the 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 way you know he was dressed, just the dominance, and I mean that was just everything to me. I, I'd never seen a more powerful image. His last know. Western that he just did, I sent him an email. Outlaw Johnny Black. I sent him an email. I said, when you get rid of my motherfucking hat, send it back to me. <laughs> I completely, <laughs> I completely bit off of his character. Like two of them. Really? You know, Charlie. And of course, you know, the, the one from, uh, from Take a Hard Ride. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, so you based that character on his movies. His look. Yeah. His, his look. look, him, look that hat. Look, is, not the character. It's, the, the image. it's like for, image. Yeah. for the, the wardrobe. Yeah. I, t I showed a picture of him. Yeah. I said, you can kill a horse. <laughs> you can kill a horse. You want to give a shit yeah. about the horse. Get my head back, man. He had this cowboy hat, nice flat rim with the silver conchos around it. Took me 
long time to find that hat. <laughs> it didn't take me as long. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wondered, how come you weren't in the movie, I'm going to get you sucker? Because I don't do funny shit, man. I'm, oh, that's why? I don't do funny, no. Do they ask you to be in it? Of course, of okay. course. Yeah, I was going to say, because every other major star of that era was I in don't, it. I don't do funny because it's like Burt Reynolds. When Burt Reynolds came into the industry, he was an action star. And he was had a little macho shit going. Mm -hmm. Then he did comedy. Now, what happens there, you mean take out his gun, he point at somebody... You think a little flag gonna come out? It says bang. <laughs> <laughs> so he went. He went downhill. He, he went downhill. Once he started doing comedy, his macho shit didn't work. But he was he was a macho guy when he first for a while. Then he went comedy and it didn't work. It's hard to do. It's hard to do both. It's hard to sustain being a comic and being a badass. It's very difficult. Not many people can do it. He is doing it because he kicks ass in this Western film with the martial arts, but I don't, I don't, I don't advise him to do more and more comedy than that. But it's comic because his martial arts, he knows how to do shit that, that's funny in itself, you know? Mm -hmm. what, what helps me is that I don't look like me. As Black Dynamite and Outlaw Johnny Black. Oh yeah, yeah, the statue I, I shit. I, yeah, I really don't look like me anymore. So that's not the image, that my serious image is kind of protected. Yeah. So I got a little, as long as you're limited. As long yeah. as you stay limited. Don't get carried away being a funny motherfucker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Hollywood strike. Yeah. The writer strike. Yeah. It's happening right now. You guys have been on both sides of this fence. You know, I mean, you guys have made your own movies, but you've also written movies. You've also starred in movies and so forth. What is your take? And do you think it's fixable? I don't give a shit about the strike. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I am. I told you. I am. <laughs> I am FICO. I'm financial core. I can work union. I can work non-union legally. And I pay union dues, but I don't pay full union dues. They still charge me for the privilege of being in their goddamn union. But I don't give a shit about the union. I don't care. I'm financial core. I work either or. I'm getting a lot of offers now from these independent guys who understand that I can work in their film. But I don't want to work in that film because it's nothing is, I mean, there's so much crap being made now, man. Mm. It's, and especially with black actors and black blacks in the film, it's just terrible stuff. And the best way you can do that is make your own or just don't do nothing. I learned, hey, this man, okay, was one of the first to be in front of the camera, then behind the camera. Mm -hmm. He was making his own movies in Italy like long time ago, when when so many everything so history historically, you know the black exploitation era saved Hollywood, right? And they talked about that at one time because yeah. at a certain point everybody could, could could afford a television set. They were not going to the movies. The studio system was dying until black movies were made, and the, the inner city was populating those movies. Now then it changed. So. What happened was, okay, 76 comes around, you got Jaws, you got Star Wars, you got the, the birth of the, the, uh, the big blockbuster movie. Yeah. And White Flight, Suburbs, everything else. So they found that they can make money without the black, you know, the black people. And so they turned their back on those actors that was only in front of the camera, right? This man was in front and behind the camera, went and started doing movies internationally, okay? Kept making a way of, you know, on his own when people had no idea that they was, he was doing something like that. But I was paying attention. That's why even to this day, 60% of my, my audience is overseas. Well, yeah, because Fred, you were saying something interesting in one of your interviews. You were saying how when you first started distributing your, your films originally, yeah. you would go overseas. Yeah. And everyone was like, all, all we could afford is give you 3000 per film because black films don't do well overseas. But you realized that was actually a hustle. It was definitely a hustle. Explain. It was hustle because they had been sold. The producers and the distributors were selling our movies overseas, had bought into the philosophy that they were selling them overseas, saying, oh, no, we don't want that movie, but we'll give you $3,000 for it. We don't want that movie. <laughs> you know? And that's what was happening. And I, when I went, started going to Cannes 
and sitting outside in the patio and just watching people and watching how they're doing business. I'm going, this is bullshit. <laughs> this is bullshit over here. Man. I mean, it took me about three, four trips in con just sit out there, man. I give the maitre d fifty dollars to give me the table in the middle of the patio out there, man. I just sit and watch and listen to the shit that they're talking. I'm going, this is all bullshit, man. You know, <laughs> you're paying this much money for that, and I'm looking over here at the grocers, what it's doing. This is all bullshit. They're selling the American people over here that it ain't making money so they can buy them cheap. That's what they were doing, and they still do that. Mm. And they still do that. And I, I, I know for a fact, because I would go, I do all these movies overseas. I'd be doing movies in Bulgaria and in, in Romania and all these different places. And when, whenever I'd be in any other country, I don't care if it's China, Japan, I channel surf. And what, what are they emulating? They're emulating our culture. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I go to the, the, the stores and meet the, the, uh, the sales agents and they're buying our stuff. Yeah. And First time, one of the first times I went to Cannes Film Festival, I'm offered movies walking down the street. Exactly. Because, you know, we're not, I mean, they're buying our stuff, but they're, they're so insulated from what we are. They, they're like, they, they have, there's, the gatekeepers ain't letting you know what's going on. And then they had this other game that tripped me out. Is this. Now, I might have told you this one other time. Like, say I did Undisputed, right? But you know what it, Undisputed was called in China. Negroes of the Iron House. What? <laughs> Negroes of the Iron House. Wow. So good luck trying to find Undisputed 2 in China and trying to track the proceeds of that. Yeah. Because it's a whole different name. Yeah. yeah, because if, if some foreign buyer buys the movie, they change the name. Mm. Return of the Dragon ain't the Return of the Dragon. You know, uh, uh, Fist of Fury is the big boss. Huh. Yeah. You know, Chinese Connections, it's, they, they, they change the names. So, you know, mm. Negroes of the Iron House, <laughs> who's going to figure that one out? Yeah, who knows where that is? Yeah, so Good. that's another game that, hey, you know, they sell, the, 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 the people selling to the overseas. Oh, oh, by the way, you know, Black Dynamite is... Uh, badass motherfucker in 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 France. I have I have a poster. <laughs> badass motherfucker. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, you know, good good luck, Mike. <laughs> if you don't know any better, you you're looking for the you know how did Black Dynamite do? Oh, didn't didn't do any didn't do out here. Zero. Because, yeah. <laughs> when you control your own film, you don't really give a shit because. I sell, I know what my film does in France, let's say. And I make a movie for a, a 200,000 200, or 350,000. I know the most I'm going to make is maybe 5 million. So I'm selling it to France for 5 fucking million. I don't care what you, you can burn it up after I send it to. You can call it rape on the Mississippi. I don't care what you call it. <laughs> Once your check cleared and, we, and I get the check, we're fine. And I move on to Spain. I know what's going on with in Spain, okay? The cheap is Mexico. Mexico is worth thirty thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. they can, after you can call it nigga, nigga in a nigga in the valley. I don't care what you call it. I've got my money. I don't have to worry about you cheating me. All oh, right, because you were saying once you figure out the game over there, yeah, and everyone's offering you three thousand, you told told everybody no, told and then on the very no. last day. And then they come back, you know what happened? The very last day they come back and they said, hey, I'm, 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 but don't tell anybody. Mm. <laughs> you know, how much you want to read the time? Well, I don't know. Okay, back. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Okay, but don't, don't tell anybody that I paid $35,000 for Mexico, okay? All right, fine. I ain't telling nobody. That's how you do it. Yep. Well, you said something interesting as well. You said that when you look at Hollywood today, there's a lot of black stars out there, but when you see the major films, it'd be like one black star and a white supporting cast. Well, a star can't be a star by himself. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to make him a star. And what makes him a star is how many projects that he does, you know? Samuel Jackson ain't the greatest fucking actor out there, but he's making gazillion dollars because when they think of five roles, they think of Samuel Jackson, Denzel Washington, blah, blah, blah. Maybe three or four guys, right? But the black audiences in the ghetto don't really give a shit about these guys. Let me tell you, they don't give a shit about Samuel Jackson. They don't give a shit about Denzel. They like guys like him, guys like me, but we ain't getting 20 million a picture or 10 million a picture. 
We got to fight and scrap and dig our own shit. We got to make ourselves viable by ourselves. They create it. They get created. But if a studio brings them in, they just automatically, this is a Sam and Sam Jackson movie, right? And how many fucking movies has Samuel Jackson made that made money? I mean, the money that he makes and the money that it costs to make a film, they don't make even, man. They, they, they don't make any fucking money. I'm going to tell you now, those movies don't do shit. Mm. Because the budgets are too big, and Samuel Jackson ain't that big of a draw. But to hot to white Hollywood, that's all they know. Mm. Denzel Washington, Samuel Jackson, and maybe two other guys. I don't even those. I can't even remember who they are. Yeah, I mean Samuel's the new Marvel series. Uh, you know the Nick Fury series. Well, Marvel that's where he belongs. You put him in the Marvel series. It could be anybody. That could be you in a fucking Marvel series. To make I mean, actually, I mean Nick Fury is actually a white character in the comic books, but they actually made him black yeah. screen, and it worked. Yeah, you know Samuel pulled it off. But they could put you in it. <laughs> you know, and sure. pull it off as long as, it. as long as it's comedy and long as it's uh, <laughs> cartoon shit, they can put you in it. But don't bring that shit to the ghetto and say, this is a bad motherfucker. No, no, come on. Right, because you were saying how, you know, when you were growing up, all the actors you looked up to, you know, like for example, like a John Wayne wouldn't be doing comedy, wouldn't be doing singing and dancing. They'd no. be the tough guy from, from the first film to their very last film. And that's what you kind of emulated. Yeah, but see, it's like Sidney Poitier, okay? Sidney Poitier was a great actor. Mm -hmm. We love him. He's very believable. But he ain't never slapped nobody. If he had, if he had been in that movie where they where he, where he was being called all his bad names and he took it standing, no, that didn't satisfy me as a kid watching that. I want to hit this motherfucker that's talking to me. Okay, mm -hmm. so we need we need a diversity. We need this guy over here who can stand that shit and and smile, and this this guy over here who can kick your ass for saying shit like that. We need both. Side, so you can decide who you are, what you want to be. You want to be like that? That's fine, but that don't mean you're the strong motherfucker because you're taking that shit. Cost could also mean you're a weak motherfucker taking that shit, mm. right? Well, that, that's how I feel. 2013, Jim Kelly passed away. Yeah, were you guys close up to his death? Yeah, Jim Kelly. Jim Kelly was. You know, I was very depressed because I saw him deteriorate. Mm. I saw him slowly. He never told anybody, but I would assume it was cancer because you see Jim and, and maybe two, three months later and his skin, I mean, his face is frail. His, you can see the skull skeleton happening. Uh, I was very depressed. I was very depressed to watch him de demise. And then to hear about Jim, Jim was very depressed because of the fact I had just played golf with the guy a month ago, mm. okay? Now I call him to play some more golf and the wife says, He's dead. What? What do you mean he's dead? That's how you found out? Yeah. Wow. He's dead. Are you shitting me? What do you mean he's dead? I still have not totally grasped that. Because hmm. it happened in such a way that makes me unbelievable that something was wrong. Something is wrong that we don't know about. Then they have this big affair in the NFL that they went to. I didn't get invited. Nobody that was friends of Jim got invited. I don't know if he got invited or not, because I know he's a number one friend, two of Jim. I don't know if he got invited to the NFL thing, but it was nothing there but friends, not all NFL people. And sh she had the guest list to invite the people who come to this this uh, thing for Jim. Did you get invited? Yeah, I went. Yeah, well, okay. So they picked, pick mm -hmm. people, right? Mm -hmm. I said, okay, something, something is, something's not right. And I still feel something not right. Michael, you and Jim were close. Hmm. How did that affect you when he passed away? Um, I was closer to Jim than my own father. Wow. No, I mean, seriously. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I used, to, I used to play chess and backgammon with Jim several times a week. Wow. And, you know, at, at his house. I mean, this, when I did uh, Black Dynamite, the first person outside of the, uh, the, the movie that I shared it with was Jim. We, I sat there basically like with my father watching the movie basically to get it, get his nod. Uh, and he oh, laughed and he, he enjoyed it. He liked it. That's, that's the toughest critic, you know, oh, at yeah. the time. So when he liked it, I, man, I, I was off to the races. Um, so, and then knowing all the things all the time as you used to spend with him. And um, how he contributed so much more in my life than very few people, you know. Um, it's it's you know 
And the fact that the, the last movie he did, it was a movie that I directed. It, it, it really affected me. And of course, that's, um, if not for those images of Jim and, and, and Fred, I don't know who I'd be, you know, honestly. Jim and I had a competitive relationship that was healthy for both of us. Because mm. it kept us sharp, kept us competing with each other, not against each other, but with each other. It was a very healthy, competitive relationship. And it looked like it might explode at any minute. <laughs> I remember playing basketball at his house one time, and he had a basketball thing against his garage. And it was attached to the garage. It wasn't smart enough to extend it away from the garage. So <laughs> if you drove, you got slammed against the garage. So I'm playing ball with him one time, and Will Chamberlain's up there, and I, and I drive to the to thing, and Jim slams me against the garage. Bam! I bam! I get up, I get up, and we grab each other. Next thing I know, we're in the air. Will got us, you motherfucker, cut that shit. <laughs> so, okay, Will, I'm sorry, man. All right, all right. <laughs> we had a very competitive relationship, but it was healthy, mm -hmm. and it was good for both of us. Jim is was amazingly competitive. Yeah, and we like we played chess. I mean, he he was a master chess player. Yeah. Right? I used to compete too, but time there was times that if I beat him, I can't leave. Yeah. <laughs> you got to stay there. One till he time, wins. I told him I had an appointment, right, and I had to go, but I won. Do you know Jim called me every kind of name in the book? <laughs> I'm not kidding. I was like. This grown ass man is calling me a punk. He's calling me everything. Yeah. Like he won't let me leave. I'm like and it was like digging deep, right? <laughs> but it, but that's that's what made him. He yeah. was super competitive. Yeah. But you know, it was healthy if you didn't really if you didn't relate to it. It was only healthy if you want to compete with it. You don't compete with it. You accept it. Yeah. Right. And Jim was always like very knee deep in the gang culture and in, in terms of trying to pacify situations and create peace in that in that culture like he would actually have actual gang members and leaders at his home i was you i was front and center yeah, yeah me Bel too. believe me because i mean one of the people that got me it was a brother named looney uh, his name was lonnie he was one of the gym's like biggest soldiers most active members him you know rockhead you know uh you know rudolph johnson who became like a another son to jim well, we all would go out to the gangs, the leadership of the Bloods and Crips, go to them, invite them over to Jim's house. And whenever they were there, I was always there because my thing is, we checking you at the, at the, at the door. So if it's going to be a hand-to-hand -hand thing, okay, you know, I'm going to have my pops back, basically. Mm. So I was always there. I wasn't as busy of, as an actor. So believe me, I was on. <laughs> you had free time. Yeah. I was there. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, with Jim and the, we go to the prisons, we do all yeah. that. But hmm. Jim, I swear, single-handedly, he stopped the, you, you know, remember you used to hear about Bloods and Crips warring, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you didn't? Mm. That was Jim. Think? That was Jim. Mm. They came to the house and settled it. Yeah, that was Jim. All of a sudden you didn't hear about that anymore because we, you know, what Jim gave the, the leadership something to lead for, you know, lead your communities. And so they were natural born leaders. And if you don't have any outlets for your leadership abilities, you're going to lead a gang. When Jim and I did uh, original gangsters together in, in Gary, Indiana, they had midnight basketball. Nothing but the gangsters would play at midnight. And me and Jim went over there and we said, we want these guys in our film. And we picked everybody that was there in our film. And once we started shooting, the police came by and said, no, I've been looking for him. I said, no, no, you can't bother him. He's working, he's mm. shooting. But you know the really great thing that happened? I paid each guy cash, you know, maybe, well, I was paying him 75 bucks a day. And sometimes I'd overpay him, give him like $82. And they say, oh, Mr. Wimson, you gave us $8, $8 too much. You know what that proved to me? That they're looking for some peace, you know? They're, they aren't really, born that way, you ain't raised that way, you know? If you give them a break, give them a chance, they can be productive citizens mm -hmm. and do well. And we had like 35 gang members working as the bad, as gangs in 
the original gangsters. So those Ooh. were real gangsters. Okay. In original gangsters. And and they go, oh my Mr. Williamson, what do you want me to do today? Oh, and, and Jim, what do you want to do? Hey, we were totally under control with them. And the police weren't very happy with that. Hmm. Well, Fred, what did you think of uh Black Dynamite when you first saw it? I was in Black Dynamite. Oh, you were in Black Dynamite. My bad. Was I in Black Dynamite? Mm -mm. What was it? What was it, Weston? Oh no, you you're talking about outlaw Johnny Black. I'll allow Johnny back. No, I'm talking about Black Dynamite. <laughs> that, that was another movie. That's a, this guy did this. That was, it was a, I don't know if you ever. I'm not sure I saw Black Dynamite. That okay. Was... Well, that, that was Michael's homage to the black exploitation era, okay. which was done brilliantly, by the way. And there's also an animated series. But let me tell you how fucked up the black, art, black, uh, black exploitation shit was. It wasn't created by whites. It got really stupid when actors start wanting when NAACP, he probably don't even know this, NAACP started calling the studios mm -hmm. and saying, we need to read the scripts before and we'll tell you if you can do this to black folks. Wow, now we're going, okay. Then it was them that saying, they start calling the film exploitation movies. It was NAACP. Really? They coined the term. It was not mm. the whites huh. production companies that was doing that. NAACP started that bullshit. You're exploiting our black actors. You're the fuck is fun? They're working all the time. They're getting money. What are you talking about? We want to read the scripts first. And NAACP, NAACP you guys are crazy. You don't have to, you're not reading the goddamn script first to okay it, to see if it's okay. That's where the shit went crazy, man. That's where everybody said, this is bullshit. Yeah, it's, it's that, it's that, that name just took, took hold of everything because, yeah. you know, People it kind of downgrades that, the genre. That, that, yeah, that name yeah. came later. Yeah. Because the true black art exploitation was what was happening. They were doing movies in Italy and all these other places that would be an, a total Italian movie. And they would cast one black person or shoot them, right? Shoot scenes with them, disconnected with the movie, and then advertise that that black person was a lead in the movie. Yeah. That's where when NAACP starts speaking about that, that's what they meant by black exploitation. But that that name got bigger than everything else. And people mess around and think uh, Three the Hard Way and Shaft and all these things or black exploitation movies when the word didn't exist yet. Yeah. The word didn't even exist till much later. Those were action movies the same way that the James Bond movies and, and all these other things were. They, those were studio movies. Yeah. Black exploitation movies. So it's the the word black exploitation just became a monster yeah. and it gobbled up everything that was black. Yep. Oh, Fred, what did you think of the Dolomite movie that Eddie Murphy put together? Dolomite was smart. Dolomite was clever. Mm. He 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 capitalized on the ignorance of people. You know, he 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 did his thing. He did what he thought was would work. He did what he thought was right, and he made it work. He made it work. He was outrageous. He was funny, but he made it work. I mean, do you know Rudy Rudy Ray Moore personally? Yeah, sure. Right, because you guys were making films of the same era. Sure was. Okay, what was your take on Rudy? Rudy again, he was smart, man. He was smart. He was he was the he was a, a smart clown. He was pretending to be a clown when he wasn't really a clown because he dressed radically, drove weird looking cars, but he was way ahead of his time in understanding how stupid people are for categorizing a film and going to see it because it was such and such and such. He, he was clever. Right, because he was gay in real life, right? That from, what, from what I understand. But you know, but he would always have, but he would be the ladies man in his movies. I don't know if he was gay or not, I don't know. Yeah. But well, he wasn't married, did he didn't have kids? I don't know, maybe he was. <laughs> 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 you were in Starsky and Hutch. Yes. How's that uh, that movie? Starsky and Hutch was was okay, but I had to tell them I was going to play the police chief. But I wasn't going to play the police chief that the last, the original police chief, the shouting and screaming and yellow, funny, overweight guy. I said that was not going to be me. I was not going to play the character that way. Mm -hmm. I was going to play it hammer style. Like when they're sitting and talking and I'm saying, why are you touching him? You know, uh, that would have not been the fat guy. Why are you touching him? What are you touching him for? No, hammer says, why are you touching him? <laughs> you know? I said, otherwise I don't fit in. I can't play this character 
like they had before. The the other uh, what the hell was his name? Uh, the first black guy who played the overweight guy played that played that lead role. I forget his name. Is uh, but anyway, I did not succumb to what the script said I should play the role as. And then I told him, if they didn't want me, forget it. He might have had the first Jerry girl, too. Yes, had the first Jerry girl. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, uh, in 1994, Snoop Dogg had a video for Doggy Dog World. Yeah. And he had all the big black exploitation right. people in it. Yourself, Antonio Fargus, yeah. Pam Greer, yeah. Ree Ray Moore, Ron O'Neill. Uh, how was that whole process? Process was, it was great, but I'm the only one who sold an image that people expect for me to do. Everybody came in and was nice and and didn't sell what people wanted to see them do, right? I did the fist bump. I did the behind thing. I walked by, boom, 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 right from here, right? This guy <laughs> slapped my hand, right? Yep. And that's when it, they, that's all they remember. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the hammer doing his thing. Pap, okay. <laughs> Everybody else was just sitting there being them, man. If they hire you for something, be you. If you got something distinctive, whatever it is, be you. Say if, if Pam want to show her shit all the way down to the neighbor, be her, you know? That's right. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Everybody just was in the movie. They didn't really have a part. Mm -hmm. They were like seen at the club, yeah. seeing in the in the thing, man. So that was the biggest thing for that movie was the way that Hammer got out of the got out of the limo and did the backhand slap. And that's all they talked about. Well, earlier we were talking about stunts. And, you know. I was talking to Fred about how he did this one stunt in Inglorious Bastards yeah. where he jumped off a bridge onto a moving train yeah. in real life. Not, not CGI, yeah. like an actual bridge onto a moving train. And I assumed that if you somehow missed the train, you would fall to the ground right, and die. See you later. But right. you don't question shit. Like, if you know your capabilities and, you've, and you're in shape, you're not just a fat ass actor trying to be a, a physical hero, I am a physical person. I work out. I'm in shape. Like yeah, he can but jump you don't off. work out jumping on moving trains. That's not no, <laughs> part of but, your workout routine. No, but my courage allows me to jump on a okay. fucking moving train, knowing that if I fall off the train, I can grab something and hold on to because I'm athletic. I ain't gonna be, I ain't gonna be bouncing on a train and go, ah, help me. <laughs> no, sir. I, I mean, Michael, would you do a stunt like that? Jump on a mo moving train? Yes. It depends, man. Depends. And how fast is it moving? How fast was the train moving? Was <laughs> it full speed? Uh, 35 miles an hour. 35 miles an hour. Yeah, I've done some dumb stuff. I've, uh, you know, <laughs> hung off a, a damn helicopter and um, and, uh, exit wounds. Okay. I did it better than the stunt guy, so, yeah, yeah and it was fun. I, I like challenging myself. You, you, know your, you know your limitations, you know? If you question your limitations, mm -hmm. you don't fucking do it. Mm. You know, you guys both do a lot of fight scenes. And, you know, you talked about how you didn't really have any bad situations with people trying to actually punch you and stuff like that. You know, we've talked about, Michael, how, you know, working with, like, Steven Seagal, he would actually punch some of the, mm -hmm. you know, stunt doubles and everything else like that. What is, you know, your overall take when it comes to these types of things? Well, my rule is I don't, I don't really do fights with actors because you want to get hurt, you want to get an oop shot, do a fucking actor. Let the stuntman double. Let the stuntman come and double. Then you got a real chance to really do some good shit and some th good break down some furniture and go through some windows and shit like that. <laughs> you can only do that with a stuntman. You can't do it with a fucking actor because you say, okay, on three, they're going to say action. And here's what you do. You duck, throw a right hook. Okay, action. Now, wait, hold it, motherfucker. Hold it, slow down. You don't listen to me now. Throw the left, then throw the right. You might get knocked out fucking with an actor trying to be a stuntman. I don't do stunts with actors. Mm. Michael? I agree. I agree. Um, and for, for myself, I've always hated bullies. And I, if I'm in a lead role, my thing is I don't want to hurt anybody. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's to my detriment because there's times where, like, somebody tells me, okay, I'll take a body shot and I'm not going to... And I hold up on the body shot. Don't want, I don't want to hit him uh, fully. But then I look at the movie and I go, it looks like I held back, right? So sometimes it goes against me because uh, I, I feel like, you know, I I don't want to hurt anybody. Of course, I don't want to get hurt. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, not but that's what it gets. That's that's against a non stunt stuntman though, an actor. 
to hit me. And they fucking hit the actor. Yeah, you know damn well. There's some fun guys who sometimes think that they can yeah, take a hit. But you can't do that. And, and, you know, I don't want to sound arrogant, but you have, my hit ain't the normal hit. I've been, if I didn't kick like a million times with the same damn leg, it's not going to be what you think it's going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, if I didn't, so it is so a lot of times, uh, like I would have somebody wear pads or whatever, and then I feel better like hitting them for a blast. And then I'm not selling out for the audience. I, I want to be able to really do so, but I don't want to hurt people. The oop shots only come when you do action with actors. Mm. You got to always going to be an oop shot. You had some oop shots? Oh, oop yeah, shots yeah. along the way? Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. you tell the guy, you know, you, you set it up and you're supposed to throw a, a right, I'm going to duck, and then and this is action. And he gets all frustrated. And, Bam! You get what the fuck. You know, what are you doing, man? They get they get frustrated and they get intimidated. Not intimidated, but wired up. You know, like let's go, let's go. No, wait, hold it, man. Yeah, my scariest fight scene in years, probably in ten years, was the fight scene I had with my wife. <laughs> did you, you read, did you did you see my comments on oh you guys kicking? Oh my god! You see my comments on you guys working on your bag? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kicking left, kicking right. <laughs> but I, I train my wife. Like, I train her in a way because ain't nobody else training with us. Mm -hmm. I train her in a way where she doesn't know how good she was. Like, so I have her hitting to where she can move me. Which, like, I'm like, nope, that hip ain't right. I'm, I'm drilling in perfect technique to where she hits like a freaking mule. But I never told her not. How to hold, how to, you know, how to not do that on set. Not hit those somebody for real. And so here I am doing a, a fight scene with her, going, oh, damn. Now she getting nervous. Sometimes she forgets her choreography. Yeah. And there was a few times where she's supposed to punch right here and she was, and she punched to the, toward the face. And I was like, and that fist was right there. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Let's try that again. Let's, let's, let's ease up on that and realize, yo, if she hits me, she going to knock my teeth out. Yeah, because she don't know, and and she, when we did her movie, she did the lead in the movie. Um, what do you call it? Uh, uh damn it. Um, yeah, no, yes, yes, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> take back, take back, right? She's doing take back, right? And she's got to do this this fight scene, like, and this guy Jay Gianon, she's got to hit him. She's and we give him a pad and everything else. Oh, I'll be fine. She knocked the shit out of him. Mm. And she doesn't know because if you throw technique yeah, properly, yeah. you don't feel it, but the other person does. Yeah. So she's not understanding, well, why is, why is Jay getting an extra pad? Because you, you, you damn near, like, you're killing him. Uh, the, mo the movie we just did, the, I, uh, well, another movie that we did, I can't even, I got to remember. I can't, <laughs> I, can't re I can't, I can't say movies right now. <laughs> Should I look up your IMDb page? No, 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 no. <laughs> Strike wise, I can't talk about. Yeah, I can't talk oh, okay, about got it. other movies. Unmentionable movies. <laughs> <laughs> There's movies that she would do where she's hurting people. Mm. And a movie we recently did, she clocked this dude by accident and he was he was shook. And he's like, I never knew a woman could hit me that hard. So, so you know, that's so what are we gonna do with all this material, man? You selling all this fucking material? We're gonna do it all. Do all this every, every last second of it. I mean, as as two two men that have done so many fight scenes, what do, what do you think is really the secret of having a great fight scene play out on camera? What's the secret? What's the secret sauce? I mean, great fight scene versus, I don't know, like a dolomite fight scene where you kick the guy and he falls into like someone's trunk and you know it's completely silly. Well, don't do anything that you're not capable of doing. Oh, huh. okay, okay. If you can't kick, don't try to kick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're gonna throw me a kick and then you're gonna go past my knee, don't do that. Mm. Cause then it's bullshit. <laughs> if you want to do a John Wayne fight, then that's a little different, okay? But don't try to be a martial artist if you don't really know what the fuck you're doing. Mm. Cause then it's silly. So for me, it's the kind of fight you want to do and the kind of fight that you're capable of doing. Then I can accommodate you and I can go either way you want to go, but don't. Give me some shit that you want to go, ah, ooh, get the fuck out of here, man. Did he tell you the Diane Carroll stuff? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we went to all that. 
Yeah. Oh, man, I remember the first time he told me that stuff. I was like, oh, man, okay. Final question from Fred before I let you go. Who do you think is the best hammer of all time? You, Hank the Hammer Aaron, or MC Hammer? Hank Aaron was the greatest hammer in baseball. Mm -hmm. Fred Williamson was the greatest hammer in football. Okay. What was that other turkey? MC Hammer. MC Hammer was the greatest singer hammer ever. <laughs> there you go. Everyone's got, the, got their crowd. Everyone's got their crowd. Fred the Hammer Williamson, man, such an honor. I've been a longtime fan. You know, you look all of 40 years old right now. I don't know how you do it. I eat black jelly beans. Don't eat the white ones. They screw you Just up. Just the black jelly beans? <laughs> you know, can I say your age? Yeah, 85. 85 years old. Yeah. Incredible. I can't Incredible. Is there, is there a secret to being this healthy, yeah. this good looking at 85? Yeah. Don't give a shit. Don't give a shit. Yeah. Nothing stresses me. Nothing stresses you. No. Yeah. My car got stolen, blown up. I don't give a shit. I'll find somebody to go get that mama and get him. I got, I'll put him in my next movie. Go find my car, go get the people, and I get a part of my next movie. Mm. You're going to work it out. Everything can be worked out. <laughs> you, know? you, you, you don't get depressed because things happen. I it's hard to depress me. That's what it is. I love don't it. light your cigar. You just hold it the whole time. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the key. Mm. <laughs> oh, I love it, man. Until next time. Yeah. Peace. Been fun.